Hey guys, welcome to PandaCast. I am Alan Sabra Panda Benet. Um, as always, please check the uh, description below if you're watching the YouTube video. There is the audio only link if you'd prefer that method. Uh, today's episode is on sleep hygiene, or uh, meaning good sleep habits. Okay. Uh, so, first of all, I apologize for being a little late and a little nasally. I was a bit sick and didn't have much of a voice uh, until uh, earlier. So, um, <clears throat> Sleep hygiene, uh, as it applies to gamers, uh, is an interesting topic because uh, this is a, a significant problem specifically towards the gamer population. Now, sleep hygiene is is proper sleep, good sleep habits. Why do you need good sleep habits? Well, you know, what if you get six hours, eight hours, ten hours of sleep a night? Is that enough? Uh, let me does, let me uh, explain a little bit about sleep to you. So sleep is very important for a variety of reasons. We don't exactly know why, but we know a lot of things happen in your body uh, during sleep. Um, now, when it pertains to to just gaming, uh, you know, we can say that uh, some evidence shows when you go to sleep, your brain sort of replays the day backwards, and it prunes out memories and things that you did uh, that weren't that important, which it judges through repetition, it judges through uh, emotional impact, um, and uh, there's a variety of reasons uh, why uh, memories consolidate in the way that they do. Um, by the way, my, my major in, um, uh, sorry, one of my majors in college, I, made, I double majored and minored, uh, was uh, behavioral neuroscience with a, a specification of learning memory. So I like learning memory a lot. So anyways, um, uh, when it comes to sleep and how that helps memory formation um, is that, uh, you know, it does that pruning thing and it helps uh, solidify connections that were made during the day. Uh, and then the sleep in the beginning of the night is important for uh, uh, things uh, in the cerebrum, basically... Um, thoughts, memories, uh, stuff like that. Uh, and then when it comes to physical activities, it comes to, to um, you know, other types of, of um, uh, memory that is muscle memory. That's what I was looking for. Uh, is um, it happens later on in in more of the later part of sleep, uh, or so the research uh, shows. So uh, things like if you're trying to get good at video games, sleep is actually important because the rote memorization they do of you know this combo is this, this frame date is this. Sleep helps consolidate that, and then what helps consolidate your combos? What helps consolidate and and solidify all that tech skill you've been practicing over and over again? The the you know the mouse and keyboard you've been using, or the, or the controller uh, that you've been grinding on until it's uh, you know um, uh, ground to to near dust. That happens when you're sleeping, okay? And of course, sleep is important for other health things as well: uh, heart health, mind health, um, uh, body health overall. But gamers traditionally have very poor sleep. It's not just their sleep patterns and their sleep habits. A lot of gamers go to sleep too late at night. Uh, they sleep a lot or they don't sleep too much. Um, and there's a variety of reasons for why this happens. Today's episode of the Pancast is to go over those reasons, um, you know, of why that happens and go over solutions, uh, things to tackle it, um, and, and ideas for you. Now, one big thing that I tell patients all the time, uh, is that good sleep hygiene is difficult. And, and one of the things you have to do in general, and this is what I say to anybody, is um, you have to um, not drink caffeine to close to bedtime. Most uh, professional literature says don't do it after uh, afternoon. Uh, and then, um, you know, in, in any afternoon at all. Then there are things like don't be too riled up near bedtime. And that's a big, big problem uh, that a lot of people have because we are constantly being stimulated in today's day and age. There's always something, the social media, there's this, there's that, there's this. Uh, and you're constantly on. Uh, and when you get closer to bedtime, you're on the whole time. And um, these things can make your brain activity go. When your brain activity is going, you try to lay down at night, you're not going to get you're not going to fall asleep very easily, okay? You're going to be tossing, turning, or distracted doing something else, okay? So um, you have to do calming activities before bedtime, specifically as this pertains to gamers. Now, gaming. The effect on the body in gaming, um, and I've said this before in previous podcasts, I believe, uh, you know, we know that, for example, the stress hormone cortisol releases while you're gaming. We know that a NASCAR racer, there was a study on this. A NASCAR racer um, had a, a similar effects to his body when racing a car, which life or death in, in NASCAR, uh, it can be. Um, increased heart rate, sweat, uh, the, the cortisol levels in, in the body as well. These all elevated 
in the setting of driving a, a car. And then they compared this to professional gamers, or rather people competing on playing video games, and found that the similar effects were, were seen. And when, when you know, competing in gaming, you get increased heart rate, you know, you sweat more, you have this increase in, in, in cortisol. It stresses out your body to play video games. Admittedly, certain kind of games. I'm sure if you play Stardew Valley, you're probably okay. <laughs> you know, you're probably not being stressed out by playing that game. You know, if you're playing a JRPG, probably not a huge deal. Take out your pace, you know, good to go sort of thing. But for the most part, if you're listening to this podcast, you, you are interested in esports, you play a lot of fighting games or FPS games or whatever, you're being riled up. If you play League, oh, you, you, you know what it does to your body. Okay. So that is, uh, you know, one aspect of it. Um, and this is why, and many, one of the reasons why, sorry, uh, just your body alone, that gaming will obviously wake you up and you won't want to go to sleep because you're riled up. You got the adrenaline pumping. So of course, if you're doing the activity close to bedtime, you're not going to want to sleep and you're going to push off sleep time longer and longer and longer. And in fact, there, there are plenty of studies showing that, uh, excessive video gaming, excessive being defined differently by every study, um, reveals increase or rather decrease in, in, in good sleep. Okay. So then you say, okay, well, you know, um, oh, sorry. Then there is also the other uh, aspect uh, of, of being stimulated, um, not just your body being stimulated or your mind being stimulated. There are other things going on. Now, uh, melatonin uh, is a hormone in your body, and this regulates the sleep cycle, your circadian rhythms. Your circadian rhythms are going up and down all day, okay? Um, and this, you can kind of correlate this with your body temperatures uh, when your bodies get, get kind of cold, okay? That's your circadian rhythm going down, and those are the times that really your body's like a, sl- a nap would be nice. You know, you're usually cold. Not when you're feeling hot and, and warm and, you know, uh, and you're going. Those are times when your circadian rhythm is up and your melatonin levels are, are inversely down, uh, and your melatonin levels are inversely correlated with where your circadian rhythm is. So with an increase in melatonin, this uh, should decrease your circadian rhythm and, and make you want to sleep. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> one thing that, that your body, uh, due to evolution of biology, just how our bodies adapted over time, uh, you know, you look up at the sky, right? What color is it? Blue. There is a specific wavelength of blue in the color in the sky that goes through optic nerve and then through the optic nerve it it stimulates essentially uh, the the suppression of melatonin and a few other things it does as well. Your body has evolved to wake up to the sight of the sky, specifically that blue wavelength that you see in the sky. Yes, this is a thing. So how does that impact you? Why does that matter? You're not looking at the sky in the middle of the night. Or are you? Your phones? Yeah, a lot of messages. Um, your computer screens? Your gaming consoles? All of these things give off that same blue wavelength. And, you know, you're wondering why your phone has a night mode that has that orange glare to it. That's why. That decreases the blue wavelength. So, when it comes to nighttime periods, you know, past if you, especially if you're one that suffers from difficulty of hygiene, uh, you know, or difficult time sleeping, you know, past like seven, eight o'clock at night, you should be using the night mode on your phone because that will decrease that blue wavelength. You shouldn't be watching TV to close bedtime because you get that blue wavelength, and of course, it gets stimulated. If you're going to be using your computer to close bedtime, there are there are um, apps on the computer that will decrease the blue wavelength. Okay, and, and by time of day, we'll actually yell or orange out, you know, your screen to help decrease blue wavelength. There are gaming glasses. What do you think those yellow gaming glasses are for? Why do you think it helps eye strain? There's a couple reasons, but one of the reasons is it decreases that blue wavelength. And there are even some studies that show that the decrease in absorption of that blue wavelength late at night can do things like, like help your sleep significantly. It can also decrease your blood pressure. It can also... Um, decrease your A1C, which is the, the the blood sugar measurements. If you're if you're a diabetic, it can do a lot of, of of fantastic things. Now, this is not because of the blue wavelength per se. Most likely, most likely is because the people who are uh, um, not exposed to it anymore are getting better sleep, and these are just uh, uh, impact of better sleep in general. Okay. So blue wavelength, big deal. Okay, uh, avoid that if you especially have difficulty sleeping. All right. And now another thing for sleep hygiene is, uh, so you lay down at night, and now there's different 
and we can tackle this in a little bit, but there are different reasons for, for uh, why is it difficult for you to sleep, okay? Um, but uh, um, one of the things that will also help is exercise. 30 minutes of exercise, and when I say exercise specifically, I mean aerobic exercise, okay, where your heart rate's going, you get a little bit of sweat going. Um, this type of exercise that stresses out the body a little bit um, is shown to dramatically increase your uh, uh, sleep and decrease your sleep latency, meaning uh, less time to fall asleep um, and you ha get better quality sleep, okay? It makes perfect sense. You tire out your body, you sleep better. Most people in their day-to-day -day lives don't tire out their body anymore because this is 2019 and we all have computer jobs, um, you know, and they, they don't do anything physical. So your mind is tired, but your body isn't necessarily tired. So the, they are out of sync. You have to be able to, to tire both of them. Do not exercise too close to bedtime, though. I'm not saying half an hour before you go to bed, do some push-ups. No, no, four to six hours before bedtime is when you should be working out if you'd like to get that benefit. Um, at least four to six hours. So if you work out in the morning and you go to sleep at night, that's fine as well. Okay. Morning workouts, by the way, have a lot of other benefits. Um, and yeah, um, it's not a bad topic for podcasts in the future. Uh, um, mornings and, and morning workouts and stuff. Um, <clears throat> okay. So um, we are um, uh, now I've defined a couple of just generic things that will help your sleep hygiene. Okay. So um, also, of course, um, um, using a good mattress, good pillow, and what is good is relative to you, okay? I always advocate to my patients to go to, like, Bed Bath & Beyond or go to some some brick-and-mortar store uh, to buy different pillows, um, you know, especially if they have, like, chronic neck pains uh, or, or upper back pains that are contributed to sleeping um, because you your body and <clears throat> your specific spine alignment, I cannot tell you what's best for you. So I say, good, just experiment. Buy a pillow. You know, try the cervical ones, try the memory foam ones. I personally use a shredded memory, or I used to use a shredded memory foam now. I use some hotel grade, one. I don't know. Um, someone else found it for me, said try this, and I did. Um, and uh, uh, try it. If you don't like it, give it a couple days, go and return it. Uh, you know, I don't know if you can return on Amazon or not. Uh, depends on, on, you know, the brand and everything. Um, but uh, that's why I always tell what I tell my patients. I cannot tell you what is best for your body, your spine, your alignment, and as well as uh, you know, soft versus uh, hard uh, mattresses as well. Um, you know, um, uh, memory foam versus not memory foam. Um, personally, I use memory foam. Some patients need uh, a firm mattress in order to keep a, a straight spine or a certain spinal alignment as well. Okay. Um, so you're saying, okay, well, you know, my sleep's okay. I sleep ten hours a night. Is it okay? Are you waking up tired? Are you really getting the benefit of the sleep during those 10 hours? Because when you're sleeping, there are certain cycles, okay? There are four stages of sleep, and then there is REM, which is rapid eye movement, which is a certain stage of, of the deepest level of sleep, which a lot of memory consolidation, everything happens in that stage. Just because you're sleeping 10 hours doesn't mean you're actually going through all four stages and getting REM sleep. It doesn't mean that you're actually getting the proper sleep. In fact, there are such things as, as too much sleep. And of course, too little sleep. Improper sleep or not good enough sleep. Where your sleep is very shallow and you never really hit down to the stage fours and REMs. Okay? And these can be due to a variety of different things. Now, when you're saying you have problems sleeping, this can go to a, a lot of different categories. One category is difficulty falling asleep. Another category is difficult staying asleep. Another category, uh, no matter how much sleep you get, you're just tired in the morning, okay? Um, and these are probably the most common categories of sleep. Now, um, or categories of sleep disturbances that I see in my clinic at least, okay? And, and when it comes to the gamer, usually it's that you sleep super late at night, like I said before, not getting a whole lot of sleep because you got responsibilities the next day, and then you just do it all over again, Okay. That is, is, you know, a unique issue to us as gamers. Uh, and I do that all the time, too, sometimes. Or I used to. Uh, I still do here and there when I feel like it. So, okay. How to get good sleep hygiene depends on, on your reasoning for it. Now, if it's difficult to fall asleep, there's a couple reasons why it can be difficult to fall asleep. And again, this is something I discuss with the patient and I ask them what their reason is. Often, to, most of the time, is that they can't get the brain to turn off. Um, and this is another one of those things where I say exercise helps and all those other sleep hygiene things I talked about before can all help about decreasing simulation, decreasing the stuff that's going on in your life, decreasing the blue wavelength, um, not, not drinking caffeine past midnight. Now, what can help go to sleep? 
Okay. Uh, this is beyond sleep hygiene. This is this is like things to fix, you know, sleep issues. Uh, there's a there's a variety of things. Uh, meditation actually is is one that is evidence based and proven that will help sleep. It helps stress. It helps blood pressure. It helps a lot of different things. Um, uh, herbal teas, not black tea, uh, or and most green teas have caffeine in them. So watch out. Um, you know, so uh, non caffeinated things essentially uh, warm drinks. That's why warm milk as well uh, can help sleep too. There's a variety of reasons, uh, a variety of theories for why that, that helps. Uh, one of them that I, I particularly uh, enjoyed when I heard was that uh, uh, the warmth essentially um, uh, causes the circadian rhythm to shift because your body temperature, your body essentially shifts um, uh, more things towards the gut, more blood towards the gut, and that decreases your body temperature overall uh, when dealing with that, that extra warmth. Um, but regardless, it is tried and true, done for you know hundreds of years. You drink something nice, warm, and soothing at night, and it helps you go to sleep. So um, then there are, you know, uh, over-the-counter things for sleep, okay? There's a lot. Uh, this is, this is a, you know, million, multi-million dollar industry. I wouldn't be surprised if it was a billion dollar industry to sleep aids, okay, over-the-counter. There are some things that work. There's some things that don't, okay? Uh, one thing that I, I usually advocate to my patients, a first-line therapy for over-the-counter uh, for sleep is melatonin, okay? Melatonin is the, exactly the hormone that your brain makes to change your circadian rhythm. I don't say this is a long-term thing. It is not. Melatonin is more of a short-term thing. And melatonin is to train your body to sleep, to change and shift your circadian rhythm. I generally advocate for one month of melatonin therapy, okay? Um, and then you will take it at the same time every night, roughly an hour before you go to bed. Um, you can adjust that time closer or farther, depending on how your body responds to melatonin. Uh, and, you know, uh, uh, try to go to bed at the same time, okay? The reason is you are training your body. This is bedtime. Okay. Now, um, what if melatonin doesn't work? Well, you know, the melatonin of the counter, depending on the brand you get, is between two to four international units, okay? Um, prescription strength melatonin is like 10 to 14 units. And it's literally the same melatonin they get over the counter. It's just you, the pharmacist gives it to you. So can you just take 10 to 14 units of, of melatonin yourself? Yes. Uh, I actually... Um, Man, my nose. Uh, I actually had a patient uh, many years ago who attempted, I don't know if he attempted suicide or what it was exactly, but he decided to down almost an entire bottle, bottle of melatonin. And then me, as a resident, I had to get on the phone with the uh, the uh, uh, CDC and the Poison Control Center and figure out, uh, like, what do I do for him? And do a lot of research as to what happens with excessive melatonin, uh, you know, uh, absorption or usage. Turns out you can't OD on melatonin, so so that's a thing uh, that I found out. Um, interesting, right? Um, and so that you know uh, makes me a lot more comfortable being able to tell a patient, like, yeah, you, you can take an over the counter to the prescription dose around ten to fourteen. No, I don't advocate taking a whole handful. No, please don't drink a whole bottle. I'm not saying that at all. Don't do that. But I'm saying that you can take more than one melatonin over the counter um, in order to help. Uh, okay. And so that helps usually with, with going to sleep. And that helps, again, retrain the body's circadian rhythms. Um, and then after that, I uh, will tell a patient, well, you know, before I go to prescription strength drugs, uh, you can also try here and there Benadryl. Uh, Benadryl is an antihistamine, okay? <laughs> Sorry. Um, and the antihistamine is uh, uh, basically, in, in a lot of patients, will put them to sleep, make you just knock right out. Uh, a lot of patients take Benadryl before they go on a plane if they're... they're uh, um, uh, I'm getting a message. Um, uh, getting on a plane if they're uh, you know afraid uh, of flying, just to knock out you know for the for the ride. Typically, twelve point five to twenty five milligrams over the counter uh, dosages, uh, depending on your resistance levels and your body itself. Most people, twelve point five is good enough. Some people need the whole twenty five in order to to knock out completely. Um, do not do this chronically. Okay, uh, there are some patients who uh, you became dependent on Benadryl. They, just, they didn't say anything wrong with taking Benadryl every single night. Man, uh, every single night to to go to sleep. Um, and they actually found out that remember how I'm saying you're not getting those deep sleep. Same thing was happening. They weren't getting those deep sleeps anymore. Their deep sleep cycles were actually all off because of that Benadryl. They were not getting. I, I don't remember if it was stage three or stage four. They weren't hitting. 
and obviously not even REM. So in the end, they became more dependent on Benadryl because they needed it for sleep because they, and they were so tired, they thought they needed more sleep, they took more Benadryl, and Benadryl is actually what's not giving them good quality of sleep. So that's why I personally try whenever I can, not everyone can, advocate against using man, uh, using um, um, uh, sleep aids chronically as much as possible. I always advocate for acute usage of sleep aids, fixing your sleep schedule, and then going back to sleep naturally whenever you can. Again, everyone's case by case. You can't apply that to every patient. Now, um, next, uh, the... Where was I? Uh, sleep, Benadryl. Oh, uh, alcohol. Okay. So you're having trouble sleeping. You decided to take a drink. Um, yes, that will help you sleep. No, don't do that chronically. Do it every now and then, but even more so than Benadryl, alcohol is very well proven to actually screw up your sleep. There are some people who drink right before bed every single time because they're like, well, I need to go to sleep, so I'm going to drink. That's actually disturbing your sleep cycle more than anything else. Do not rely on alcohol to help you sleep. Again, here and there, once a, I don't know, month, probably okay. Obviously, don't do it to access, uh, but it is not a sleep aid and chronically will actually damage your sleep cycle and your quality of sleep will go down significantly. Now, how to get better quality of sleep if you don't do anything wrong? One big thing. Oh, I forgot to mention this earlier. Do not use your bed for anything else. And this is a big thing that a lot of people forget. Do not use your bed for anything else but sleep. Don't read. Don't have a TV. Don't have a gaming console. Don't play your waifu gotcha game, like me, um, <clears throat> in bed, because you will your body will start associating those things with bed, with sleep, and you're, you'll be, A, more tired when you do those things, and B, uh, more awake when you're in bed because your, your body's no longer thinking of your bed as just bed. In fact, this even shows in esports. If, you're, if your bedroom is the same place where you train and where you, you compete, that your brain essentially does not associate that very well. It's actually better to separate those rooms. And actually, it's best to have a different office altogether, uh, you know, a different building you go to, a different locale completely from where you do your day-to-day -day living than where you, where you do your job or compete because of the way that the brain works and the way that the effectiveness, the efficiency that you have, the associations that your brain makes. And this can disturb your sleep quality. And this can, you know, can disturb your sleep cycle in general. When you go to sleep with the TV on, do you really think you're getting good quality sleep? Not really. There are some people who need sound to go to sleep. And that sucks. It sucks that they've become dependent on that. Uh, because the sound doesn't really help your sleep late or sleep uh, uh, quality either. In fact, it's shown that, that white noise in general can decrease your sleep quality and you're not getting that deep enough sleep because you hear these sounds and you kind of rustle a little bit you don't really wake up but that brings you back up when you're hearing these sounds okay what can you do if you need the sound of sleep well put your tv on a timer or or make sure whatever noise is going on goes away well what if you live on a busy street i'm sorry it's gonna be difficult for you you're gonna have to pad the windows um and uh, um uh, try to block out the noise as much as possible. Yeah, you can use fans, you can use white noisemakers, but if, you know, a, 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 a police car runs by your window that wakes you up in the middle of the night, it's it's difficult. It is difficult for me to, to uh, help you or to advocate for any solutions in that sort of scenario. You know, um, other than the white noise, you know, that, that drowns out the other things, which will, you know, inevitably decrease your sleep quality, uh, but you can still try to get decent sleep, you know, uh, uh, you know, here and there. Okay, so there's that. And then uh, sleeping for too, non too long, not really getting quality sleep again, it has to do with that, that sleep uh, uh, quality. And also, it also has to do with when you come out of sleep. So excessive sleep does not help anything really. Excessive sleep can make you more groggy, more tired because of, of the when you come out of the sleep cycle. And coming out of the sleep cycle more naturally is really the way to go. There are many alarm clocks that are designed to, to wake you up depending on the movement that it detects because you move more uh, your brain has less less your body your brain uh, quiets the body down completely in like REM. Uh, you shouldn't be moving at all in REM sleep. And if you do those, there are certain sleep disturbances and, and, and things like sleepwalking, for example, is one example of that, uh, where the body does not, uh, or the brain does not turn off the body during time of, of uh, REM uh, sleep. 
that's a different category altogether. And then as you wake back up, uh, you'll, you'll, you're moving more. And there are, like I said, alarms that will actually detect your movement and will naturally try to wake you up around stage one to two of your sleep. Uh, so it feels better. I have an alarm clock right now that I'm experimenting with that uh, is, a, is a UV sunlight that turns on over time, over a course of like 20 minutes, I think, um, and will naturally wait, uh, you know, alert your body that is open because, yes, uh, uh, those UV light, it does go through the eyelids to some extent, so it stimulates the exact thing I was telling you about and to stimulate that weakness, and then it starts playing a noise, a uh, soft noise that wakes you up. Before I had that alarm clock, I would have to have two alarms, uh, you know, uh, in fact, when I was in college, I had an alarm, and, and David uh, still hates me to, the day, to this day for that, I wake him up no matter where he was in the building, where uh, I just had so much trouble waking up, I had to wake up, like, by adrenaline, pure adrenaline, you know what would wake me up, would scare me shitless every time I heard it? My dad yelling at me. So one day, I said, hey, dad, come over here to this, this microphone. I recorded my dad yelling at me. I put it on an old iPod, and I, and I plugged that iPod into this alarm clock. So every morning in college, my dad would yell, Alan, wake up now! And I was scared shitless, jump out of bed. Um, also, not the best way to wake up. Just, just letting you know. Eventually, I had to stop that. <laughs> okay. So um, that natural way of waking up can sometimes help those people who are difficult in the mornings or who sleep too long and actually find that counterproductive. Now, what is the right amount of sleep? Oh, there's been a lot of studies on this. Frankly speaking, this is where I feel evidence-based uh, medicine uh, falls a little bit or, or falters a little bit, is that we try to find a number and apply it to everyone. We try to say, this is everyone in these categories, whereas everyone has these little nuances. Everyone's a little bit different. And I always advocate trying to champion knowledge and, and, and self-awareness to try to figure out what is the best for you. Okay. So um, there are studies showing that six hours is the best. Uh, many studies showing seven to eight hours is the best. Um, some studies showing that 10 hours is actually detrimental. Some, uh, some studies showing that four hours a night is, is uh, very de- detrimental to your health for a variety of things. Uh, I got away with four to five hours of sleep uh, in college. Uh, I've gotten older. Now I'm getting around six, and that's good for me. If I get if I get 10 hours of sleep, I actually have a, a huge headache, and I'm, I'm useless for that day. Um, you know, so I can't sleep more than one ten. I mean, I can. Uh, it just it just sucks to to go out my day after that. Um, it's almost like I'm hungover all day. It makes no sense. I've always been like that. My dad is too. And by the way, there's there's all the sleep issues too. If you wake up with headaches and things like that, uh, and that's that's other categories. Um, where was I? The right amount of sleep. So so the right amount of sleep depends on you. the The correct answer is likely somewhere between six to eight hours. And that's probably the sweet spot that what every study basically agrees on uh, is the best timing. It depends on you, depends on your body, depends on your needs. And don't be afraid to experiment a little bit, but realize that, you know, built up sleep deprivation, getting four hours of sleep at night, you know, for a week's on end, you're going to have that that rebound effect where you're going to have to sleep all day one day to, to catch up on sleep. And that actually uh, has been shown to be detrimental in many ways. And again, if you're getting four hours of sleep, you're probably not getting memory consolidation in, in things like muscle memory and things. So that's actually detrimental to you uh, in, in, in making new memories and forming new memories and, and remembering things that you're trying to remember. Okay. Um, that's the sleep hygiene stuff. Then I went over that. Okay. Um, I really should start writing these down so I remember where I am and, and have a, a guide forward. Uh, I'll do that from now on. Where was I? Uh, the... Something I thought of with the sleeping and the waking up and the, okay, whatever. I'll move on. Um, so, oh, snoring. Okay, so uh, snoring, sleep apnea. Um, so, just because you snore doesn't mean you have sleep apnea. Just because you snore uh, doesn't use uh, doesn't mean um, uh, that you have a, a disorder or a problem. However, many people do have sleep apnea, and if you snore, you should be aware if you have sleep apnea. Now, what are you looking for in sleep apnea? Well, A, waking up with headaches, B, uh, waking up tired, not getting enough sleep, being somnolent during the day or, or tired during the day, where you're falling asleep with red lights, falling asleep in the middle of conversations. This is a bad thing, okay? Um, what what makes you predisposed to have sleep apnea? A lot of different things. It can, it can be a structural reason. Now, sleep apnea is where you do not get a full breath 
at night for various reasons. You're not getting the air. Okay. Uh, number one reason why this happens, uh, especially with Americans, is uh, the neck, the thick neck. Okay. Uh, greater than, I think, 15 or 15 and a half inch neck, like I do, uh, predisposes you towards having sleep apnea. Okay. Just if you have a thick neck, this can be from being fat or genetics. Uh, and I used to be, you know, a larger, I was 30 pounds heavier earlier this year, even, um, you know, uh, uh, and I have a thick neck on top of that. So like between the two things, uh, my, my, uh, airway, you know, a patent airway like this and open airways like this, and it closes like that, uh, when you have sleep apnea and it, and it closes to the point that you can't breathe. Okay. You don't always wake up. In fact, most times you don't wake up when you have sleep apnea. Okay. Um, and this is what sleep apnea is like. So you're snoring, you go, <laughs> That's normal. But if you hear, that's an apneic episode. The breath stopped. You stopped breathing at that point. And then all of a sudden you had to take a deep breath in. Okay. If you snore or if a loved one tells you that you snore, or if you're wondering, I would highly suggest getting an app on your phone that detects sound when you're asleep. Okay. Um, and when it detects sound when you're asleep, uh, it, you can actually hear your snores and then listen for those apneic episodes when you have that that gasp of breath. And if you have that, that can be sometimes something severe. Sleep apnea should be treated. Doctors used to wonder all the time, why did it was the most common time for heart attacks between 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning? It turns out that's when sleep apnea was at its worst for, for the normal working person um, was between those times. So uh, uh, it affects stroke risk, heart attack risk, um, blood pressure. It affects diabetes. It affects a lot of different things and makes your whole body worse, not getting quality sleep. And it makes weight gain as well. It makes it harder to lose weight. You know, so it's a vicious cycle. It's hard to lose weight, but well, it's caused by weight. Well, then you gain more weight and then it just gets worse and worse. Okay. A lot. And you can talk to anyone that has sleep apnea. Once they get on a CPAP that's comfortable, that they wear all night, they can actually tell you there's a huge difference in their energy levels and how they feel every day. Because guess what? They're getting quality sleep. Sleep apnea or apnea episodes boost you back up to that stage one, stage two of sleep, or it wakes you up sometimes too, rarely. So you're going down, 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 apnea episode, back up to one, two, down, 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 apnea episode, back to one, two. You're forcing your sleep cycle back up every time you have that. Maybe you'll have parents, family, loved ones that, that you've heard these apnea episodes. Please advocate that they go to their, their primary care physicians uh, and, and ask for a sleep study, uh, especially if you have the symptoms of daytime somnolence like I described. Okay. Um, and the reason I tell this to gamers is that a lot of gamers uh, that I know snore. And the reason why I go to esports events all the time, you know, I've been in those things where we, we pack six to eight guys in a hotel room <laughs> that we're all sharing, uh, been there, done that. And, uh, and yeah, a lot of guys, I heard a lot of chainsaws in my time. Okay. Now I know I've been a little, uh, you know, up and down dealing with a lot of things and, and I apologize a lot. I think 12 messages at least now. Um, so uh, I may have forgotten something. If I forgot anything, please ask, uh, and I may do another edition of this uh, regarding other sleep issues uh, down the line. And uh, now I'm gonna—I did ask again on Twitter uh, if you want to follow me at pg underscore samurai panda. Um, if there was any other questions people want me to answer about sleep hygiene, uh, let me get to those real fast. Body pills, yes or no? Now. It depends on the waifu, okay? This is a very important uh, question. Now, it, if you have... No, I'm kidding. So, well, body pills. Fascinating uh, question in, in, in reality, in all seriousness, because, uh, you know, what does it do? So there are some studies showing that body position, spinal alignment uh, can be helped by things like body pillows, okay? Specifically, spinal alignment uh, in the upper extremities, if you're hugging a body pillow, this is actually a better position for your thoracic and, and not really cervical, like lower cervical spine, but you're mostly your thoracic spine. So if you're having upper back pains, especially when you're waking up with the over, upper back pains or your oppositions, that can help, okay? And then uh, low back pain. There's actually studies showing that low back pain, uh, if you have low back pain, uh, you can help it, not fix it, to, 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 to help it by putting your legs and wrapping your legs around a body pillow as well. A human being would suffice if you sleep next to someone too. Um, so that helps. Um, do you need them? No. Do I advocate for them for the normal person? No. I might advocate here and there depending on a specific issue for a body pillow. Sure. Does it hurt? No. Uh, there are also some people who snore more when they lay on their back. Snoring, by the way, happens more when you lay on your back or have worse sleep in general when they sleep on their back. Uh, in that case, uh, you know, they sleep on their side and they have difficulty staying on their side. A body pill can sometimes help 
tuck it in right next to your back and, and lay on that, and you just won't roll over as much. Another trick for not rolling over, get a tennis ball, get some duct tape, or uh, you know, sew it, and put it in an old T-shirt in the, in the low back and like middle way back down. Okay, so when you roll over at night, you kind of roll on that d- tennis ball, and then you kind of go back to where you were before automatically. That's a that's another trick, a cheap trick for doing that. And of course, they make wedge pillows. They make a lot of different things uh, that can help you roll back over. Um, then next question: Thoughts on using Z drugs for acute insomnia? Uh, again, I went over the over-the-counter drugs. Uh, if you'd like to discuss uh, prescription medications, there are tons of prescription medications. I tend to always ask a patient what are their issues, what other medications they take, what other medical history do they have, you know, why do they have difficulty sleeping? If it's they wake up in the middle of the night or not, if it's the difficult sleep latency, uh, if it's waking up in the you know in the morning being tired, etc. I ask those questions, uh, you know, first and foremost. <laughs> before uh, I prescribe anything, okay, and, and like I said, I did it over the counter stuff. Oh, uh, interesting, if for over the counter that I forgot to mention, Rem Fresh is a brand name that I know of, but uh, long-acting melatonins, it's a fairly new thing, uh, works pretty well, works pretty well, uh, and and I've now been pushing patients, so I, there's many, there's very few options for me as a physician that other than super hard medications to help fix waking up in the middle of the night, especially when there's now no outside stimuli. It's not like they heard, you know, uh, you know, the dog bark in the middle of the night and they woke up. No, they just wake up. Uh, it's difficult to, to treat that. Uh, I've now been starting to advocate first line for that long acting mel- melatonin before I give those, those harsh prescription medications. Um, because <clears throat> like I said, it is, it is difficult to, to stay asleep. I have to do long acting things. Um, what the heck was that? Oh, Oh, I think someone invited me. Oh, Racy invited me to play uh, TFT. Oh, I want to play TFT. I'm really into that game. Um, now, oh, next question. Uh, Rashid asks, what is the best way to get over jet lag for people who travel across distant time zones? Excellent question. Very difficult. Uh, I typically uh, advocate for a hard uh, reset uh, to the time zone that you're going to. A couple days before you travel, uh, start shifting your sleep schedule, okay? Um, and then when you get there, I actually advocate for things like the Benadryls, for things like the melatonins, for the things that, that you really should take chronically uh, to to stay up as much as you can. Then take one of those sleep aids, you know, and fall asleep at the time that you're supposed to fall asleep, okay, in order to do that. Um, and if you're trying to adjust very quickly, that's where you need the Benadryls and stuff. If you have more time to adjust, uh, then you can try to naturally and just stay up and then just crash. Uh, that helps too. And that's a pretty good technique for for uh, adjusting the time zones for people that travel uh, quite a bit. Now there are people who who suffer from sleep shift disorder, uh, which is uh, specifically a disorder of people who uh, <coughs> have night shifts here, then day shifts, and night shifts, and they they shift a lot. So it's their circadian rhythms are always off. And that's very difficult to deal with, and and you need a combination of caffeine, medications, and other things to to stay awake and to fall asleep. Um, but in the temporary, you can use the over counter things. You can use different techniques like that. Uh, sometimes staying awake on a plane will help, or falling asleep. It all depends on. A, your home time zone, B, the time zone of where you're going to, and C, the travel time getting there. Uh, and you, you just try to adjust to the time of the day that you should be asleep based on the time zone that you're going to. So if you're traveling for a tournament, the tournament is in you know a completely different time zone across the world. A few days before, the, before you go to the tournament, start shifting your sleep schedule, and then hard shift it as soon as you get there. Uh, <coughs> next question, why do you think people don't clean properly slash at all? Wrong kind of hygiene. Uh, <clears throat> then the next one, um, what is sleep? Are you telling me I shouldn't play Final Fantasy fourteen until I black out? Look, I'm just saying that, like, there are... Pff, honestly speaking, Final Fantasy fourteen is one of the better MMOs out there from what I hear now. Like, there are, there are better games to keep you up at night, like TFT. Uh, that one that one really, really screws your schedule. But, uh, yeah. Um, that is uh, it, I guess, for this PandaCast. Uh, please... Uh, leave me a comment below. I'm going to try to get back on the regular grind of these things uh, now that I'm not, not too sick and my time has gotten a little bit better. Um, if you have any suggestions for future podcasts that you want me to cover, please let me know. Uh, you know, I'm running out of topics, <laughs> so I would appreciate that. Um, I am going to eventually try to shift this to an interview uh, type of podcast as well where I bring in guests, uh, and we do that that too down the line. Uh, thank you again for, for tuning in, and remember, keep it PG.